Hey farmers, welcome to We're All Ears, the Golden Harvest podcast mini-series airing throughout Harvest 2021. My name is Kara Hart, and it's great to have you with us. Last episode, we talked with Golden Harvest agronomists to get their recommendations for creating the best 2022 crop plans for corn. So it's only fair that we spend this episode solely on soybeans. I'm thrilled to be joined by Ryan Fuller, head of soybean strategic marketing for Syngenta, and Mike Tollefson, Syngenta soybean product placement scientist. And I can't wait to discuss the soybean market and considerations for the 2022 variety selection. Let's get right to it. This is We're All Ears. Ryan and Mike, it's so good to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to give soybeans the spotlight they deserve in today's episode. Can you two tell us a little bit more about yourselves, your experience in the ag industry, and what you do in your current roles? Mike, let's start with you. Yeah, so I grew up on a dairy farm in southeast Minnesota. I worked in the seed industry for almost 30 years now, uh, largely in research and agronomy roles. And my current role allows me to look at soybeans that are in the final two years of testing with the organization. And, and so my role is just to help decide which varieties should be commercialized and, and allowed to be sold and which ones should never ever see our customers field and so that's what i do with Syngenta. what about you ryan yeah um been with the organization for 15 years um spent some time you know early on in, in seed production but i spent the bulk of my career focused on soybeans uh, i had the privilege to work alongside of mike for many of those years as a product placement scientist and then leading the team where we really focused like mike said on the late stage development uh, you know, recently I jumped to the uh, head of soybean strategic marketing. And what I really like about that role is I get to play that crucial uh, spot that kind of ties the here and now that the product managers are focusing on with more of our long term strategy. So I get to build out, you know, what the midterm strategy is for the organization. And it's been just uh, something I've always had a lot of passion around is strategy and taking what we're doing today and transitioning how that will lead us and set us up for success down the road. We know that the soybean market has evolved in recent years. For example, the soybean market today in 2021 is incredibly different from the soybean market of, say, 2001. Ryan, can you walk us through some of the history of the soybean market and how we got to where we are today? Yeah, so when I think back over my time in soybeans, which goes back to 2012, but have the exposure earlier. I think there's some things that really jump out to me. Um, speed would be one of the first things I would would talk about. And when I mentioned speed, there's things like variety life cycle. So back in the 2000s and even up to 2010, a variety had a longer life cycle in the marketplace than what it does today. You know, things are happening quite quick and there's rapid turnover in portfolios. So that speed is one significant change I've I've recognized. Also, if you think about herbicide trait platforms in soybeans, for a long time, it was built on conventional soybeans. Then we transitioned to Roundup Ready soybeans. Then it was Roundup Ready to yield soybeans. And then on to Roundup Ready extend soybeans and so on and so forth. But the timing that each one of those is in the marketplace has been condensed. And so there's constant change and it's all about speed. The next big thing would be around innovation. And that innovation over 20 years is has been huge and it goes across all aspects of seed development, you know, farming, just agriculture in general, whether it's from breeding techniques that are driving genetic gain, whether it's these multiple mode of action herbicide traits that are out in the marketplace today, to evolutions in seed care that have really changed. If you look at a, a treated seed market where it was 20 years ago to where it is today and all the things that can be incorporated to protect, protect that investment season long. It's been huge uh, leaps and strides made. The next pillar I would touch on would be just data and information. If you think about the data that's collected and analyzed now versus 20 years ago, you know, there's information coming off of planters, sprayers, combines, drones. There you pair that with harvest results, plot results, all of that. The, the information that's available now versus 20 years ago is, is significant. And then all of that. I'd summarize it is it, it is more complex, but when you can harness the information and the power of that data 
it can really help drive your decision making for a customer, for a farmer uh, to, to utilize all of that information as inputs to truly drive a decision for your farm. You know, I, I hope, I wish all of you that uh, are listening to this podcast right now, wish you could see Ryan's eyes light up whenever he talks about all this. You can definitely see how passionate he is about the topic. I know Mike is too. Mike, is there anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I, as we think about how we got to the point where we're at now, where there's a lot of different herbicide trade platforms in the marketplace and how it has become more complex. I, if we think about it, history is full of examples of Mother Nature overcoming a single form of resistance, whether it's rootworm beetles overcoming crop rotation or uh, soybean cyst uh, race shift or in particular, weeds uh, becoming resistant to herbicides. You know, we've had to adapt in agriculture. And I think that's part of what's really driven the change and, and the rate of change. Um, we have to come up with multiple modes of action to kill weeds. And yet we're at a period of time where weeds are becoming more difficult to kill, but there are fewer and fewer new active ingredients coming along. And so the the seed industry has reacted by breeding in resistance to uh, in these soybean varieties to multiple existing AIs. And so it's kind of a natural reaction by the seed industry to do what we can to help control weeds. But that's, I think that's really part of what's driving the, the change that we've seen is just uh, keeping up with, with Mother Nature and some of the things that she's throwing at our customers. Mike, I think it's amazing how quickly all of this can be done. It's just really impressive to me how quickly that a company like this can adapt or even just the industry, how quickly the industry can adapt to make changes that are needed on, on farming operations. It, it takes a tremendous amount of effort and resource to do it. But again, if we don't adapt, uh, we, we won't be able to continue increasing the yield potential that we're seeing. And you know, every year, it seems like I talk to somebody who just can't believe how far yield potential have come in the field. But again, if we if we stop innovating, I think we'd stop seeing that that increase in yield potential and maybe even start going backward in some areas. So it is really important that we continue to invest in some of these innovations or our yield potential levels are going to plateau. Soybean farmers today have a lot of choice when it comes to their seed selection. Which trait platforms, genetics, and varieties should they choose? Now, Mike, from your perspective as a Syngenta soybean product placement scientist, what are some of the most important things that soybean farmers should consider when they think about their variety selections for 2022? Yeah, that's such a great question, Kara. You know, I remember as a kid, my dad would get done milking cows and sit in his easy chair and pour over local plot data to try to figure out what varieties to plant the next year. Um, we've come a long way in the access to information, but I think uh, temptation is maybe just to, to look at what yielded the most in a local plot, but I think there's a lot more to it than that, particularly with soybeans, because uh, certain diseases can have such a huge impact on the success of your soybean crop, it, it can almost nullify the, the small yield differences you can see year over year. And so uh, I guess what I tell our researchers is we need to put our grower hat on when we're evaluating soybean varieties. So we could have uh, a variety that's a bushel or two better than another variety in a perfect environment, but if it gets white mold, you could lose 80% of your yield and, and that would be devastating. And so I think knowing your own farm and, and your own fields and then matching a soybean variety to that field that has the, the disease characteristics and the agronomic characteristics that are required by that field are, are really important. How do you decide or how do you select, you know, which diseases um, you focus on, you know, for the next year, for example, or how do you, how do you make that decision of, of how you approach this? Well, it's really listening to our customers and, and what they're dealing with. I think that that's really important, especially for us as, as researchers, we need to be in tune with what's going on in the marketplace. And, and so, for example, just the other day, I, uh, we had some some researchers taking harvest lodging notes, and they were asking how they should do it. And I said, 
just put yourself in the place of our customers. If uh, it looks like those beans are lodged and it would be difficult to get a combine through and get all the, the beans into the head, then give it a bad score. If it's standing well enough, you think uh, it wouldn't slow down harvest and they'd be able to get all the beans into the head and give it a good score. And it's really just as simple as that. It, it, a lot of times when we're evaluating soybean varieties is what would work well for our customers. Ryan, is there anything else you'd like to add to this piece of the discussion? Yeah, you know, I think the other big thing facing, you know, customers and farmers today is just around the, the soybean herbicide trade choice. And, you know, there's lots of different things that can go into making that um, decision. You know, it, it could be driven by the weed species and what's going to offer your best control. It could be what's, you know, friendly with your operation, you know, because of the variance and post-application windows and certification requirements and making sure that just you're thinking through, you know, at the each individual field, what's going to make sense in the overall operation when you're on top of the variety specific selection, you got to start maybe at a level higher and understand, you know, what's the trait, what's the trait that I really need to go after for my farm that's going to set me up for success. So it's a really interesting, you know, that weed management piece is really important to farmers and ranchers. It's a really important tool in the toolbox, Ryan. I wondered, you know, can you speak to some things we saw this year that maybe would benefit for farmers next year or, or thoughts of, of where we've been and, and where we're headed? Yeah, so there there's definitely some learnings. Um, it's hard to generalize and put things together. You know, geographically, there's some trends, but even within those geographical trends, there's certainly different outliers. And so to make comments that would go across the board would be, you know, ill-advised, but making sure that you understand the technologies, you know, the benefits of, of both, I think is really important, whether it's a, you know, a post tank mix flexibility or an application date, there's lots of things that, that should weigh into that decision, but you can't comment, you know, broadly across acres and geographies because each individual situation is different. So yeah, absolutely. There was learnings on what worked really well, but it's going to be at that local level. It's going to be really, really important. Let's talk a little bit more about the breeding and commercialization process for some of these traits. Yeah, we, I guess we often think of or refer to it as our breeding pipeline, but it's actually shaped more like a funnel. Each year, our breeders make thousands of breeding crosses that result in potentially millions of new soybean varieties. And so we need to quickly thin the herd and, and get it down to the, the very elite lines. And so if you think about it in just a, a period of a, of a few years, we'll, we'll go from, again, potentially millions of new lines each year to a point where we launch about uh, 25, 30 new lines, maybe on average each year across North America, maybe a little bit more now uh, that we're on several different herbicide trade platforms. But it that's kind of the game is, is finding those outliers, finding those varieties that have all the different traits that we need and that our, our customers require. And, and so you have to sift through a lot of different lines to find that perfect one uh, for our growers, but that that's kind of the game. Ryan, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, I think what's important to understand is is how that funnel has changed over time, and the the innovation we talked about earlier, and how that in, increases the probability of success of everything that goes in the start of that funnel. You know, if you look back over twenty years, it was a bit more of a numbers game, and that's still part of it. But how can you stack the deck in your favor? And that's what these new technologies have done is they've really increased the probability of commercial success potential on everything that goes into the beginning of that funnel. And then what's really important is the work that Mike and the rest of the, the product placement uh, organization does is the, the rigor in which they put varieties through those last couple of years before they go out to the commercial organization is a huge benefit to Golden Harvest. And I think it's something that truly does separate, you know, a Golden Harvest product versus others. And, you know, our experience has been, you know, as we've looked at just products across the industry that have maybe not been as successful um, as what people thought, it was really, our data showed it was historically because of, you know, either inaccurate or inadequate screening on these different disease and agronomic traits, right? We've had lots of yield locations for a lot of years. It's those 
things that are more difficult to work with that take more shots on goal. You know, it's not easy to run a, a sudden death syndrome nursery or a soybean white mold nursery. You know, they joke that if you if you have a soybean white mold problem, the best way to get rid of it is to put an R&D trial there because it seems to cure it every time. But the work and effort and energy that that organization puts in to create those environments to ensure that we have the best product information when we go to launch a product to a farmer, I think that's that's been a, a key focal point, a key differentiator for Golden Harvest. Mike, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think Ryan made a lot of good points about how we evaluate soybean varieties. And one of the technologies that we rely on really heavily now that, that didn't really exist uh, even a short time ago is our reliance on molecular markers. And that's one of the technologies that we use to really go from those you know, potentially millions of new soybean varieties. And very quickly, we can screen these varieties and find out which ones have the right traits and which ones don't, and get that number down to a manageable number so that we can start screening out in the field for different disease and agronomic characteristics. So that's just an example of, of one of the technologies that's used really heavily now that, that maybe 20 years ago wasn't in play. So things, again, are, are rapidly changing. We're, we're evolving the way we develop varieties every year, but that's been a, a game changer for us. So we know now that considering the agronomics of a variety should be first when farmers are making seed selection. What about yield data? Ryan, how should this play into seed selection? Yeah, so it's it's definitely an important aspect. And I like the analogy of when Mike was a, a kid, you know, his dad was sitting around flipping through a local plot result book. And, that, you know, that was the way for a long time is how does it how did it perform, you know, last year in my given geography? And What's really important with all the capabilities out there now is, is understanding really what's happening across the environments and understanding, you know, that plot result you're looking at in that local book is the environment that that experienced representative of what a farmer could expect to experience seven out of 10 years, or was it, you know, an outlier and the capabilities that the industry now has to understand things from the environment to soil characterization really enables a more robust set of information to be considered because it's not just what happened in my backyard. It's understanding that your backyard is often represented in a lot of backyards across the bigger geography. And when you can harness those additional data points and understand that, yeah, it may not be local, but the environment that it's being tested in represents what I see in my local environment year on year, it's really important. And those capabilities just didn't exist in the past. And so yield information is, is critical to, uh, to variety selection. And it needs to be a combination of both those local results, but harnessing the, uh, the technology and power of just the larger information and data set that can feed and drive some of those decisions. Because, you know, customers and farmers will be coming off years that, you know, had a major drought that we haven't had a drought in certain geographies for years. And do you really want to make your variety selections on what performed well in that drought year if you can only expect to see a drought one in 10 years? Or do you want to find the varieties that performed better in the environment that you would more typically see? And so it is important, but it's really important to understand the information you're using to drive to that decision. Well, and Ryan, I think what you're hitting at here is, you know, the more informed you are, the better decision you're going to make ultimately at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. And like I said earlier, you know, the complexity is out there. There's data coming in from from every piece of equipment, every drone, every cell phone, every app, um, which is all really good. But it's it's the process of boiling down all that complex data into a means that can make a simplified decision is really the sweet spot. And that's where we're making the progress still today. Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, we understand it, it. Some of the concepts that Ryan went over are, are he's absolutely spot on, but it, it's complex. Figure that out. And so we've really made an investment in our Golden Harvest Seed Advisors to try to arm them with better technology and better tools so that they can use some of this data that we have from a wide geography to help place products at a local level. And so. Um, I think they're really have become a, a strong resource to help 
variety selection at a, at a grower level. To wrap us up today, do any of you all have final advice or recommendations to soybean farmers as they begin to make their plans for the 2022 season? I guess my, my closing comments would be, um, you know, there's been a lot of change in the industry over the years. And a lot of that change is beneficial and for you know, all of our benefits, specifically, you know, the farmer, or the customer. So utilize the technology, the information that's out there. Work with your local you know, seed experts in your purchasing decision. Really understand your farm and the variation that you have even within your acres uh, to make that best individual seed selection to set you up for the best success in 2022. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about perhaps an increase in soybean acres, and I think that's yet to be determined at this time, but there could be a lot of interest going into 2022, Ryan. That's absolutely right. And that brings me a lot of energy. <laughs> Mike, what, what would you like to share as we wrap things up? Yeah, I think we certainly are seeing that increased interest in soybeans. There's a lot of questions, but also, as you mentioned, a lot of interest and there's going to be a lot of acres. And so uh, the herbicide trade platforms have definitely grabbed a lot of attention. They've kind of been the highlight the last couple of years, but I think in today's current environment, you really have to decide first and foremost which trade platform you're going to be on. And then once you make that decision, then you can begin to look at genetics within that trade platform. But it really is important to keep genetics in mind so that, again, we have the right defensive traits to match the acre. When we think about product availability for next year, Mike, I know that that factors into a farmer's decision, probably for the seed selection. So, you know, is there anything you'd like to say about, you know, things that they should prioritize as they make their seed selections, um, whether it should be genetics or cost of production or anything in those lines? Yeah, I think maybe there is some concern, particularly in the in the northern and western er areas of the U.S., because we, in a sense, seed companies are are farmers when it comes to growing their seed. It's a living, viable product, and so. Uh, there was some drought in the West, and that affected seed production a bit. Um, we anticipate having enough seed uh, this year. It's not like I'm trying to drum up a uh, uh, fear of shortage here, but uh, it, it will play in a bit. And so uh, I think it is good to, to uh, sit down with your seed supplier early and, and talk about uh, supply and get those uh, varieties that make sense for, for your farm booked uh, this year. Ryan and Mike, thank you so much for your expertise today. It's been great to have you on this podcast. This is Golden Harvest. We're all ears. There are only two more episodes left. Join us next week for an interesting conversation about the carbon market, emissions trading, sustainability and ruminants, and what this all means for farmers. You won't want to miss it. So subscribe to We're All Ears on your preferred podcast streaming platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And remember, just like you're listening, we're listening too. So join the conversation and interact with us at Golden Harvest on Facebook and Twitter or Golden Harvest Seeds on Instagram and tell us what you thought of the episode. Thanks for listening to We're All Ears. We'll catch you in the next episode.